Um, welcome to Kara's Cures, where we explore the leading edge of wellness. I'm Kara Sundland. So have you ever wondered why you handle money the way you do? Today, we are taking a deep dive into finances with New York Times bestselling author of Know Yourself, Know Your Money, Rachel Cruz, who is joining us live now. Thank you for being with us, Rachel. Uh, I apologize, guys. I don't hear Rachel, Angelo. Oh, no. Oh, now two. I got gotcha. you. Now we got gotcha. you. Okay. Got it. We're, we're on this first day of November. Apparently, um, we're having technical issues. But anyway, you're with us now. So, and I've got your book here, and you know, it really I think speaks especially to all of us, really, but especially maybe to women who we lead sometimes with our feelings. But we have kind of this underlying programming, and we know that some of us grew up comfortable with money, some of us didn't. So let's start there. How does our childhood actually impact the way we handle money today? Well, it makes a huge impact because your childhood home was basically your classroom growing up. It's where you learned all of life's lessons, including your money. So depending on if you grew up in a household where money was talked about versus if it was not at all, uh, versus if the environment around money emotionally was stressed or was it calm, all of these things play a factor into how you view money today and really how you handle it. And again, it's, it's not this one-to-one -one handoff, but it does shape your perspective around money. Well, and so many people will say that like, oh, you know, there's even books like the Rich Dad's Playback book or, you know, if someone grew up with a lot of comfort around money, then they might um, handle it better as an adult. But I think for people who didn't grow up with that, maybe they grew up with scarcity or fear in their house. They're worried, I'm going to mess that up. And, and that's a fear, you say, that kind of drives us, but we don't have to let it drive us if you're fearful that you're just going to recreate what your parents did. That's right. One fear I hear around money a lot is I don't want to end up like my parents. Like, I don't want to just do what my parents did because you're realizing, OK, they weren't perfect. You know, we all we all can say that about our parents. But to know, OK, I can make different decisions today. So, for instance, if you grew up in a household where money was just not talked about, learning to engage that conversation and even on just a basic level, just talking about things like work with your kids or giving or saving. It doesn't have to be these complicated issues. But just getting in the rhythm of verbalizing and talking about it really opens the door to conversations. And then learning to live in an environment where, where money is a calm subject. And really the way to do that is to be in control of your money. So whether that's on a plan, on a budget, but it's amazing when you can put these things into your own life, these good money habits, how it changes your household. So you're right. How you grew up does not have to dictate your future and your current nuclear family. Well, and you talk about that with social media and everything, and I think we're all worried about our kids and they're looking at the latest Instagram trend and saying, I need this, I want this. We've all heard about keeping up with the Joneses, but you say really there's a lot of, there's just rules on how we govern our money. And a lot of it has to do when we're comparing ourselves to others. And of course, that's the wrong way to be doing it. How can we undo that? Yes, the comparison game is real. And I feel like I'm in it all the time and I have to stop myself and be like, Rachel, Stop. But it is hard because you're seeing all of these images, all of these messages, and you get this glimpse into people's lives. And so getting to a place, I think, as a person, whether you have kids or not, to be able to say, OK, I want to be able to look at something, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram, and just say, hey, good for them. Good that they got to go on that great vacation or good for them. They redid their kitchen, whatever it is. And to be able to have the humility and the awareness to say, hey, that's their story. It's not necessarily mine right now, because here's the deal, too. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes of every picture. You don't know, possibly, the second mortgage that was taken out to redo that kitchen. Or you don't know the sacrifice of 24 months of saving up for that great vacation that you're now seeing, right? So, so you're having to, to look at this filter of our lives. And when you do that, and if you have kids in your household, they're going to pick up on that, because more is caught than taught, and so teaching your kids about, yeah, there is a struggle, but hey, there's also a solution and it's called contentment. Right. Contentment. Feeling like we just have enough, right? That could be a good affirmation. I have enough. But debt is also a problem. It can be paralyzing. And uh, you know, a lot of people, the, the, the most watched show right now on Netflix is Squid Games about people trying to get out of debt and this crazy game that they're playing. But you actually put in the book, uh, I think people always wonder, they read, how am I going to get out of debt? Some people feel like I can't get out of debt. You have a way that you say is the best way that sort of builds some momentum and motivates you. If you are in debt, what's your advice? 
Yes, well, the number one thing you want to do is just to know your current state and where you're at. For a lot of people, they don't even know what kind of debt they have. They don't know the debt amount. They just kind of pay the minimum payment and they kind of just shove the bills to the side, you know, kind of like, oh, I don't want to know. So coming to grips with reality is really important. And part of that is to list out all of your debts, smallest amount to largest amount, regardless of the interest rates, pay minimum payments on everything and pay off that smallest debt first. Because what happens is when you pay off that smallest debt, we like to say that hope is injected into the situation. You actually say, okay, I can do this. Because when you feel like you're in the cycle of debt and you're just making payments and you're living paycheck to paycheck, it feels impossible. But when you stop going into debt, you pause everything else and you work extra, you make extra income, you, you slash your expenses and you put everything towards that smallest debt, even if it's a $600 Macy's credit card, but you pay it off. You suddenly have hope that, okay, I can do this. And then all that money that you're paying on that, you roll it over to the second smallest debt. So we call it the debt snowball, but it really is the most effective way to get out of debt. And on average, people are getting out of debt in 18 to 24 months. Wow. Okay. And that leads to freedom, which is really what everyone wants. They just want freedom. Um, but you say we're kind of wired sometimes uh, how we are. Are you born to be a saver or a spender? Uh, what if your spouse is one or the other? I mean, I guess you have these seven different money types. And are we kind of wired that way, the same way you're wired to be tall, short, blonde, dark? You know, I think it's probably both. I think it's, it's your natural personality that you're born with, but also your environment, like we talked about earlier, shapes a lot of that. But yes, you usually fall into one of two categories, whether you're a spender or a saver. And the beautiful, ironic thing about marriage is opposites attract. And so usually if you're the spender, your spouse is the saver or vice versa. So I know for me, I'm actually the spender in our relationship. I am a natural spender. I have been since I can remember. And my husband is more of the saver. And so you kind of learn, okay, we both have strengths. We both have weaknesses. But learning to work together and communicate is a huge part of winning with money, especially when you're married. Well, and let's talk about that. I mean, you grew up in a situation where your dad was an expert in money, Dave Ramsey, and you just you, you learned a lot, I'm sure, from that. But if you're in a situation now and couples are wondering what's the best way to manage money together, um, how do you do that? What, what's your recommendation for couples managing? Should only one person pay all the bills or should you both be in it all the time? Well, there's really two things I would say. Number one is you want to have this team mindset. I think we live in a culture today that it's like, hey, you run your lane, I'll run mine. You have your checking account, I have mine. My income goes here, yours goes there. You pay these bills, I pay these. And it's like you're like a like business partners or something. But it's amazing when you come together on your money and you actually see each other as, hey, we're not working against each other. We're working with each other and for each other. What that does in your relationship is unbelievable because money touches every part of our lives. And when you have a spouse, someone that you share a bed with, that you share kids with, to say, hey, we're actually going to share this really kind of scary part of our lives, our money. Mm. And we're going to come together as one. It changes the conversation. And so that's kind of the, the uh, mental state, I guess, you need to be in first and foremost. And then number two, just tactically budget together. Have one budget. And now should the, the nerd who loves the numbers do the budget? Sure but you bring it over to what we call your free spirits, the, the person in the relationship that's like, eh, not so much. But you come together and you sit down and you say, hey, here's our budget. Let's talk through it, change things as we need to change them. But you actually agree on where your money's going. And that, that eliminates so many money fights and money problems that couples have because they just don't talk about it and there's not a plan in place. Right. And it can feel overwhelming. In today's day and age, it's so easy, right? Everyone's Amazoning everything or maybe there's subscriptions. And there's probably a lot of maybe costs we don't even know that we're spending. Do you recommend that we not really make it so easy to buy things? <laughs> well, you know, spending is a part of our day to day lives, right? We have to spend money. But I think realizing that a lot of companies are really good at what we call removing the friction. And so it's this, yeah, swipe. I mean, I, I hate to say it, Amazon's one of the best at it. And I can say it because I fall for it all the time. You know, it's just like this one click purchase. They have all your information. And so if there's some things you can do, especially when it comes to purchasing online, which we do all the time, to, to put some friction in place. So one thing I've done is I don't try to have a, an account with every store that I shop with online because it makes me check out as a guest. I have to go through and put in all my information and it just causes a, 15 second delay. And I just did this the other night. I'll be honest. I was on a website and I put some stuff in a cart 
and I did. And I went through the guests. And by the time I got to, I was like, Rachel, you don't need it. It was like three new shirts. I'm like, I don't need it. And I stopped. I really did. And so it just, it just allows you to think through your purchases versus just the really simple act of buying so quickly. I, I think I might be you and I'll be like, I'm busy, I'm this, I'm that. And and so if uh, Amazon, you're right, the other websites, you can kind of, oh, that's too hard. I'm not even going to do it. But Amazon, you know, a thumbprint, that's all you need. And it's like, buy now. I know. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, it's, it's great all the technology we have. But I guess that's part of it is you say, know yourself, know your money. So if one of you tends to be impulsive, uh, my father used to teach me, if you have a disability, make use of it. So I guess if you know you're impulsive, you know you're that free spirit, you know you get excited, you might want to put some fail safe measures or make it a little bit more difficult for yourself. Um, I want to. Yes, absolutely. And, and I'll say this too. One thing with the budget specifically, I always tell people a budget is permission to spend. A budget doesn't mean that you have to like live in a cave and, you know, only come out with coupons. Like, like you can live your life and it's great. And a budget just allows you to spend on purpose. So if there is money there in the budget line item to go and buy those three new shirts, you know, you can, I think asking yourself some important questions is really key. Um, but that's the thing about a budget is it allows you to create a life that you love and it gives you guardrails and boundaries, but you're able to spend without guilt and shame. Uh, but even if it's in the budget, I would say still have some friction there to make you second guess. Well, people get overwhelmed by a budget too. They'll just, well, I don't know. I make this money and I don't know, the bills are gone and I have, I don't know if I have enough left. I don't know, whatever. So what's your easy solution to making a budget? Uh, a zero based budget. So this is going to be fifth grade math. You have your income put that at the top of a sheet of paper, or I use an app called Every Dollar. It's, uh, we, we've created here at Ramsey Solutions, but I love it. You have your income at the top and then all of your expenses underneath. And again, you may have to go back to your checking account and look back for the last three months to just say, hey, I got to categorize some of this. Put dollar amounts next to those categories. And then your income minus those categories should equal zero. So every dollar coming in is already assigned to a name. You already know when my paycheck hits, here's exactly where the money's going. And again, it could be in savings as well. It could be in giving. Um, but also, you know, hey, here's how much we pay for streaming services or cable or insurance or a cell phone, out to eat, groceries. It lists everything. And yes, it can kind of feel overwhelming. I understand. But it's amazing. When you actually are intentional with your money and you know where your money's going, you will feel like you've got a raise. You don't realize how much money you spend without thinking about it. When you have a budget, you have a plan, you know exactly where it's going. Well, and you're not living with that feeling of, I don't know, I probably shouldn't spend this or I shouldn't. That I guess what you're saying is it's, it's permission to live your life and you can feel really good about getting your nails done or doing something for yourself if you accounted for it. Now, let me ask you, if you're making the budget, a lot of us get paychecks, you've picked your 401k, whatever. should you just start with the money that comes in your check, not like the before the taxes, before 401k? Start with whatever you're getting deposited into your account, right? Exactly. Yes. So the money that hits your account to know, okay, yes, after tax, after retirement, all of that, what is the money I have to use for my household this month? And when it comes to spending, you talk about something else with, in this culture of where we're all kind of, there's so much messaging out there. We should ask ourselves some questions. And in one of them, you say, if no one ever sees this purchase, do I still want it? Yeah, it's a convicting question. <laughs> I would say it's one that I've, I ask myself quite frequently, um, you know, because as a spender, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is cute. This is fun. But in the back of my head, am I thinking, OK, I'll probably get a compliment on that. Oh, I know. OK, yeah, yeah. I, I know someone's going to see that and be impressed by that. Right. And, and these are very natural, normal thoughts. But when that fuels your spending, it's amazing because you end up spending for other people rather than just yourself. And so this is one thing I put into place a few years ago. And it honestly has relieved me by for so much. I mean, not just saving more money because I'm not spending it, but really questioning my motives. And like we were talking about earlier, how everything is on display these days, whether it's social media or, or otherwise, you know, we're used to being in this habit of, yeah, everyone's going to see this, but what if they don't? So ask yourself, yeah, if nobody sees this purchase, do I still want it? If I can't post this on social media, whether it's a car or a vacation Am I still going to enjoy it? I mean, it, it is tough questions to ask, but it really gets to the heart and the root of your spending. And you want to find your why as to why you're saving, right? Because otherwise you could feel a little pride, like, oh, I can't buy this. I can't buy this. But instead you're saying you can have your dreams. You may just not get your dream this second. But if you're the reason I'm choosing to make a grilled cheese instead of order DoorDash is because I'm going to that Hawaii vacation, that why is going to keep you motivated and make you feel good? 
Absolutely. Your why is your dreaming, right? Knowing what you're working towards and that is connected to your savings. And so whether it's, yeah, my dream is to be completely debt free in 23 months or it's, hey, I want to save up for this vacation. I want to replace this car with cash for the first time ever in my whole life. Whatever that why is, have that goal out there. And there is something powerful about knowing where you're going. And I think that's one mistake people make with money is they kind of just live month to month and then April 15th comes around and they look and say, where'd all my money go? Where am I going? You know, and they don't have enough in retirement. It's just kind of, it, it's the cycle. And so instead of letting your money just happen to you, you have to happen to it. And part of that is having those goals and those dreams, which is your why and why you're doing things you're doing today with money. Well, you know, our wiring is everything, right? Our emotional blueprint is sort of the hardware we're dealing with, the software rather that we're dealing with. But I love that in the book, um, you you really have people figure out who they are, I guess. So we know what we are. Are we a spender? Are we, did we grow up in a classroom of scarcity or security? Um, but you say when money mistakes happen, you have to respond. Did you respond with a lot of grace or not enough grace? Because I think so many people are living with shame. Like I messed up. Uh, I, I should have been saving since I was... 20, like everyone said, and I didn't. And, and, and then the shame kind of just prevents them from moving on. And shame is something you want people to get a handle on. Absolutely. Yeah. When I talk about money, I just, I know always, and people listening and watching this right now, you know, that there is, there's a lot of regrets, a lot of guilt that comes with this. Because out of all the things in our life, money is always interesting because it has a number to it, right? Like I can't say, oh yeah, I'm, I struggled being a mom you know, last week, it was a hard mom week. There's no number for that. Or I feel like I'm just, I'm a great wife these days. There's no number for that, but for your money, there's a number and there's something about that. And I think in our world today, we have created our, our self-worth around our net worth and we have to break that. And so to say, yeah, the mistakes you made, yeah, you're seeing the numbers around that. Sure. But it's not who you are. It's not your identity. And the other powerful thing is, you get to change. You get to wake up tomorrow and say, hey, I'm going to choose something different with my money because I'm not happy with the results I have today. What I've been doing, I'm getting these results and I don't like these results. So now I'm going to change what I've been doing. And that's the beautiful thing is we all get to wake up and do that. But you, you have to have that level of hope that what you're changing to is better than your present. And that's what I want people to know is that what you can change to is one, what we we're talking about, a freedom of control of your money, not owning you, but you actually own it and allow it to be a tool in your life to create a life you love. And it's never too late, right? I think that's the hopeful part is that if you have gone through some, a job loss or problems and you're not even quite sure how you're going to get out of the mess you're in right now, this, um, your book is going it to, it's filled with people and stories and, and advice about it's never, it's really never too late. Like you could actually make this the point where you're going to sit down and just get slightly more educated or make a few changes. Um, it doesn't mean you have to go out and find a job that's going to pay you twice as much. That's exactly right. Your income is not going to fix your money habits. And so putting your habits in place. And, and I do want to encourage people, you know, at Ramsey Solutions, we've been doing this for 30 years now, which is just crazy, three decades. And we have seen every type of person, every type of income, every type of debt level. And I'm telling you, the only consistent thing about seeing people get out of debt and find freedom is the belief that they can. So anyone out there, even if you feel like it is impossible, it is not. There is a level that you can say, I can have this plan and I can work and actually make decisions that's gonna better my future. And it is possible. We see it every single day. Okay, and there's a lot of resources out there. I want to let people know they can find more of your financial information, your tips at rachelcruz.com. You also have a YouTube show. People can follow you on social media at Rachel Cruz. And I'll just show folks the book again, Know Yourself, Know Your Money. I assume you can get this wherever books are sold. That's exactly right. Yes. Well, Rachel, thank you for being here. Thank you for giving people some hope. I know it's been a tough year and a half right now, but it's a good point. We're resetting everything else. We might as well reset the way we think and feel about money. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Kara. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for watching Kara's Cures. You can watch this episode and more on the Channel 3 app. Just look under Kara's Cures. You can find other episodes on wellness and follow me on social media as well at Kara Sundland. Have a great day.